from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of DevOps Virtual Forum, brought to you by Broadcom. Hi guys, welcome back. So we have discussed the current state and the near future state of DevOps and how it's going to evolve from three unique perspectives. In this last segment, we're going to open up the floor and see if we can come to a shared understanding of where DevOps needs to go in order to be successful next year. So our guests today are, you've seen them all before, Jeffrey Hammond is here, the VP and Principal Analyst serving CIOs at Forrester. We've also got Serge Lucio, the GM of Broadcom's Enterprise Software Division, and Glenn Martin, the Head of QA Transformation at BT. Guys, welcome back. Great to have you all three together. Hi, Lisa. Good to be here. All right, so we're very, we're all very socially distanced as we talked about before. Great to have this conversation. So let's let's start with one of the topics that we kicked off the forum with. Jeff, we're going to start with you. Spiritual co-location. That's a really interesting <laughs> topic that we've we've uncovered. But how much of the challenge is truly cultural, and what can we solve through technology? Jeff, we'll start with you, then Serge, then Glenn. Jeff, take it away. Yeah, I think fundamentally you, you can have all the technology in the world. And if you don't make the right investments in the cultural practices in your development organization, you still won't be effective. Um, almost 10 years ago, I wrote a, a piece um, where I did a bunch of research around what made high performance teams, software delivery teams, high performance. And one of the things that came out as part of that was that these teams have a high level of autonomy. And that's one of the things that you see coming out of the Agile Manifesto. Let's take that to today where developers are on their own in their own offices. If you've got teams where the team itself had a high level of autonomy um, and they know how to work, they can make decisions, they can move forward. They're not waiting for management to tell them what to do. And so what we have seen is that organizations that embraced autonomy uh, and got their teams in the right place and their teams had the information that they needed to make the right decisions have actually been able to operate pretty well, even as they've been remote. And it's turned out to be things like, well, how do we actually push the software that we've created into production that have become the challenges, not are we writing the right software? And that's why I, I think the term spiritual co-location is so important because even though we may be physically distant, we're on the same plane. We're connected from a uh, from from a uh, a shared purpose. Um, you know, Serge and I worked together a long, long time ago. Serge, it's been what almost 15, 16 years uh, since we were at the same place, and yet I would say there's probably still a certain level of spiritual co-location between us uh, because of the shared purposes that we've had in the past and what we've seen uh, in the industry. And that's a really powerful tool uh, to build on. So, what do tools play as part of that? to the extent that tools make information available to build shared purpose on, to the extent that they enable communication so that we can build that spiritual co-location, to the extent that they reinforce the culture uh, that we want to put in place, they can be incredibly valuable, especially when, when we don't have the luxury of physical, physical co-location. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> It does. I should have introduced this this last segment as we're all spiritually co-located. All right, so Serge, clearly you're still spiritually co-located with Jeff. Talk to me about what your thoughts are about spiritual co-location, the cultural impact, and how technology can move it forward. Yeah, so, so I think, um, well, I'm going to sound very similar to, to Jeff in that respect. I, I think, you know, it starts with kind of shared purpose and understanding how individuals, teams, uh, contribute to kind of a business outcome. What is our shared goal, our shared vision? What what is it we're trying to achieve collectively, and uh, and keeping kind of aligned to that. Um, and so so it really starts with that. Now now the big challenge obviously is over the last you know twenty years, especially in large organizations, there's been specialization of roles and functions. And so we we all have started to basically measure what we do. Um, on a daily basis using metrics, which oftentimes are completely disconnected from kind of a business outcome or is shared purpose. We, we kind of revert back to, okay, what is my database uptime? What is uh, my cycle time, right? And, and I think, you know, what we can do or what, where we really should be focused as an industry is to start to basically provide a lens for these different stakeholders to look at what they're doing 
in the context of kind of these business outcomes. So, um, you know, probably one of my um, favorite experience was to actually witness at one of a large financial institution, um, you know, two stakeholders across development and operations staring at the same data, right, which was related to, you know, incoming changes, um, test execution results, you know, cover coverage, um, application liabilities, and on the other end, kind of uh, um, production level incidents. And when, when we start to put these things in context and represent that in a way that these different stakeholders can, can look at from their different lens, and, uh, and and can start to essentially communicate and, and understand how they jointly are contributing to, uh, to, to that kind of common vision or objective. And Glenn, we talked a lot about transformation with you last time. What are your thoughts on spiritual co-location and the cultural part, the technology impact? Yeah, I mean, I agree, I agree with Jeffrey that, you know, um, the people and culture are the most important thing. Actually, that's why it's really important when you're uh, transforming to have partners who have the same vision as you, um, who who you can work with, have the have the same uh, end goal in mind. And I've certainly found that with our um, you know continuing relationship with Broadcom. What it also does, though, is although you know tools can accelerate what you're doing and can drive consistency. You know, we've seen within Simplify, which is BT's flagship transformation program, where we're trying to, as it kind of says, simplify the number of system stacks that we have, the number of products that we have. Actually, at the moment, we've got different value streams within that program who have got organizational silos who are trying to rewrite, uh, rewrite the wheel, um, who are still doing things manually. So in order to try and bring that consistency, we need the right tools that actually are at an enterprise grade, which can be flexible to work with in BT, which is such a complex and very di um, different environment, depending on what area BT you're in, whether it's a consumer, whether it's a mobile area, whether it's large global or government organizations. You know, we found that we need tools that can um, drive that consistency, but also flex to greenfield, brownfield kind of um, technologies as well. So. It's really important that, as I say, from a number of different aspects, that you have the right partner um, to drive the right culture, who have got the same vision, but also who have the tool sets to help you accelerate. They can't do that on their own, but they can help accelerate what it is you're trying to do. And a, and a really good example of that is we're trying to shift left, which is probably quite a bit of a, a buzz phrase in the kind of testing world at the moment. But you know, I could talk about things like um, Continuous Delivery Direct to one of Broadcom's tools, and it has many different features to it, but very simply on its own, it allows us to give the visibility of what the teams are doing. And once we have that visibility, then we can talk to the teams um, around, you know, could they be doing better component testing? Could they be using some virtualized services here or there? And that's not even the main purpose of Continuous Delivery Director, but it's just a reason that tools themselves can just give greater visibility have much more intuitive and insightful conversations with other teams and reduce those organizational silos. Thanks, Glenn. So if we kind of sum that up, autonomy, collaboration, tools that facilitate that. So let's talk now about metrics. From your perspectives, what are the metrics that matter? Jeff. Well, I'm going to go right back to, to what Glenn said about data that provides visibility that enables us to to make decisions um, with shared purpose and so business value has to be one of the first things that we look at um, how do we assess whether we have built something that is valuable you know that could be sales revenue it could be net promoter score uh, if you're not selling what you've built it could even be what the level of reuse is within your organization or other teams picking up the services uh, that you've created um, one of the things that i've begun to see organizations do is to align value streams with customer journeys and then to align teams with those value streams. So that's one of the ways that you get to a shared purpose because we're all trying to deliver around that customer journey, the value associated with it, and we're all measured on that. Um, there are flow metrics, which are really important. How long does it take us to get a new feature out from the time that we conceive it to the time that we can run our first experiments with it? 
there are quality metrics. Um, you know, some of the classics are maybe things like defect density or mean time to response. Um, one of my favorites came from a, um, a company uh, called Ultimate Software, where they looked at the ratio of defects found in production to defects found in pre-production. And their developers were in fact measured on that ratio. It, told them that guess what? Quality is your job too, not just the test uh, department's uh, group. The fourth level that I think is really important uh, in, in the current uh, uh, situation that we're in is the level of engagement in your development organization. We used to joke that we measured this with the parking lot metric. How full was the parking lot at nine and how full was it at five o'clock? I can't do that anymore since we're not physically co-located, but what you can do is you can look at how folks are delivering. You can look at your metrics in your SCM environment. You can look at uh, the relative rates of churn. Uh, you can look at things like, well, are our developers delivering uh, during longer periods, earlier in the morning, later in the evening? Are they delivering uh, you know, on the weekends as well? Are those signs that we might be heading toward uh, burnout because folks are still running at sprint levels instead of marathon levels? Uh, so all of those in combination, uh, business value, uh, flow, engagement and quality, I think form the backbone of any sort of, of metrics uh, uh, program. The second thing that I think you need to look at is what are we gonna do with the data? And the philosophy behind the data is critical. Um, unfortunately, I see organizations where they weaponize the data and that's completely the wrong way to look at it. What you need to do is you need to, see, need to say, how is this data helping us to identify the blockers, the things that aren't allowing us to provide the right context for people to do the right thing? And then what do we do to remove those blockers uh, to make sure that we're giving these autonomous teams the context that they need to do their job uh, in a way that creates the most value for the customers? Great advice, Jeff. Glenn, over to you, metrics that matter to you that really make a big impact and 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 also how do you you know measure quality kind of following on to the advice that Jeff provided I mean Jeff provided some great advice actually he talked about value and he talked about flow both of those things are very much on my mind at the moment um but there was a, I listened to a speaker uh, called Mick Hurston a couple of months ago who talked very much around how important flow management is and remove you know and, and using that to remove waste to understand in terms of you know making software changes, um, what is it that's causing us to do it longer than we need to? So where are those areas where it takes too long? So I think that's a very important thing. For us, it's um, even more basic than that at the moment. We're on a journey from moving from kind of uh, waterfall to agile. Um, and the problem with moving from waterfall to agile is you know, with Waterfall, the, the business had a kind of comfort that, you know, everything was tested together and therefore it's safer. Um, and with Agile, there's that kind of, you know, how do we make sure that, you know, if we're doing things quick and we're getting stuff out the door, that we give that confidence um, that that's ready to go. Or if there's a risk that we're able to truly articulate what that risk is. So there's a bit about release confidence um, and some of the metrics around that and how, how healthy those releases are. And actually saying, you know, we spend a lot of money um, um, and investment setting up agile teams, training agile teams. Are we actually seeing them deliver more quickly? And are we actually just seeing them deliver more value quickly? So, you know, those are the two kind of main things for me at the moment. But I think it's also about you know, generally bringing it all together, the DevOps, you know, we've got kind of value ops, AI ops, how do we actually bring that together to uh, so we can make quick decisions and making sure that we are um, delivering the biggest bang for our buck. Absolutely, biggest bang for the buck. Serge, your thoughts. Yeah, so I think we, we all agree, right? It starts with business metrics, flow metrics. Um, these are kind of uh, the most important metrics. And, and ultimately, I mean, one of the things that's very common across uh, highly functioning teams is engagement, right? You, when, when you see a team that's highly functioning, that's agile, that practices DevOps every day, they are highly engaged. Um, that, that's that's definitely true. Now, the you know back to I think uh, Jefferson's point on weaponization of metrics. One of the key challenges we see is that um, organizations traditionally have been kind of uh, you know, setting up benchmarks, right? So what, what is a good cycle time? What is a good lead time? What is a good mean time to repair? The, the problem is that this is very contextual, right? It varies, it's going to vary quite a bit depending on the, the nature of the application and system. And so one of the things that we really need to evolve um, as an industry is to understand that it's not so much about those flow metrics, it's about how these flow metrics ultimately contribute to the business metric, to the business outcome. 
So that's one thing. The, the second aspect I think that's oftentimes misunderstood is that you know when you have a bad cycle time or, 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 or what you perceive as being a bad cycle time or bad quality, the problem is oftentimes like how do you go and explore why, right? What is the root cause of this? And I think one of the key challenges is that we tend to focus a lot of time on metrics and not on the eye type patterns, which are pretty common across the industry. Um, you know, if you look at, for instance, things like you know, lead time, for instance, it's very common that uh, organizational boundaries are going to be a key contributor to bad lead time. And so I think that there is, you know, beyond the metrics, there is, I think, a lot of uh, work that we need to do in terms of classifying these anti patterns. Um, you know, back to, to you, Jeff, I think you are one of the co authors of Water Scrum Fall as a, as, as a key pattern in the industry or anti pattern. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But water scrum fall, right, is, is a key one, right? And you will yeah. detect that through kind of a defect arrival rate that's where it, that looks like an S curve. And so I think it's beyond kind of the, the metrics is what do you do with those metrics? Right, I'll tell you, Serge, one of the things that is really interesting to me in that space is, I think those of us that have been in the industry for a long time, we know the anti-patterns because we've seen them in our career, <laughs> maybe in multiple times. and. One of the things that I think you could see tooling do is perhaps provide some notification of anti-patterns based on the telemetry that comes in. I think it would be a really interesting place to apply uh, machine learning and reinforcement learning techniques. Um, so hopefully something that we'd see in the future with DevOps tools, because you know, as a manager that that you know may be only a 10-year veteran or 15-year veteran, you may be seeing these anti-patterns for the first time. And it would sure be nice to know what to do uh, when they start to pop up. <laughs> <laughs> that would, right? Insight, always helpful. All right, guys, I would like to get your final thoughts on the, the, the one thing that you believe our audience really needs to be on the lookout for and to put on their agendas for the next 12 months. Jeff, we'll go back to you. I would say, look for the opportunities that this disruption presents. And there are a couple that I see. First of all, uh, as we shift to remote centric working, uh, we're unlocking new pools uh, of talent uh, where it's possible to implement uh, more geographic diversity. So, so look to that as part of your strategy. Number two, look for new types of tools. We've seen a lot of interest in usage of low code tools to very quickly develop applications. That's potentially part of a mainstream strategy as we go into 2021. Finally, make sure that you embrace this idea that you are supporting creative workers, that Agile and DevOps are the peanut butter and chocolate to support creative uh, workers with algorithmic capabilities. Peanut butter and chocolate. Glenn, where do we go from there? What are, what's the one silver bullet that you think folks should be on the lookout for? I'm, I'm hungry now. Uh, I certainly agree that um, low, low code is uh, next year, we'll see much more low code. We'd already started going, moving towards a, a more of a SaaS based world, but low code also. Um, I think as well for me, um, we've still got one foot in the kind of cloud camp. Um, you know, we'll be fully trying to explore what that means going into the next year and, and exploiting the capabilities of cloud. But I think the last, um, the last thing for me is how do you really instill quality throughout the kind of um, the, the life cycle? Um, we, when I heard the word scrum for, it kind of made me shudder because I know that's a problem. That's where we're at with some of our things at the moment. So we need to get beyond that. We need to be releasing um, changes um, more frequently into production and actually being a bit more brave and having the confidence to actually do more testing in production and going straight to production itself. So I expect to see much more of that next year. Um, yeah, thank you. I haven't got any food analogies, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> we all need some peanut butter and chocolate now. All right, Serge, take us home. That's uh, what's that nugget you think everyone needs to have on their agendas? So it's interesting, right? A couple of days ago, we we had kind of a, the latest state of the DevOps report, right? And if you read through the report, it's 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 all about velocity, right? It's all about we we still are perceiving DevOps as being all about speed. And so, to to me, the key advice is in order to create kind of that uh, spiritual collocation, in, in order to foster engagement, we have to go back to what is it we're trying to do collectively. We have to go back to tie everything to the business outcome. And so for me, it's absolutely imperative for organizations to start to, to plot their value streams, to understand how they're delivering value and to align everything they do from a metrics to delivery to flow to those metrics. Um, and only with that, I think, are we going to be able to actually start to, to really start to align kind of all these roles across the organizations 
and, and, and drive not just speed, but business outcomes. All about business outcomes. I think you guys, the three of you could write a book together. So I'll, I'll give you that as food for thought. Thank you all so much for joining me today and our guests. I think this was an incredibly valuable, fruitful conversation. And we appreciate all of you taking the time to spiritually co-locate with us today. Guys, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. For Jeff Hammond, Serge Lucio, and Glenn Martin, I'm Lisa Martin. Thank you for watching the Broadcoms, Broadcom DevOps Virtual Forum.